isa pagsulong narito ako para sa pagwawasto pagdaluyong narito ako para ang galat na lahat na pulo magiging muon na buo Pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong, narito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat na pulo, magiging muon na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban, pagumpay sa ating bayan sa daibigan paglaya ng sangkatauhan narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa pagsulong narito tayo para sa masang aking Pilipino narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo magiging muog Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong, narito tayo para sa masang aking Pilipino Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muong na buo Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proletaryo Good afternoon, international comrades and to our migrant and kababayans. Magandang gabi naman po sa inyo dyan sa Pilipinas. Mapagpahayang pagbati po para sa ating lahat. Before we start, we would like to extend our deepest condolences to all the Filipinos who have lost their homes, livelihood, and families in the recent calamity that struck our country. We stand with you in these difficult times and condemn the inaction and uselessness of the Duterte's administration in responding to people's needs. We will continue to resist and fight for the interests of the people and hold this administration accountable for the lives and homes that have been lost. Again, welcome back to the National Democratic Online School. We are already on our third episode of our Engel Serie. So if you have missed any of our episodes, you can find it posted sa ating Facebook page, Anakbayan Europa. Today, we will discuss Engels' anti-during philosophy on political economy. So this will be another exciting and challenging episode that we would love to have with you. So if you have questions to Tito Job, please just drop it on the chat box or the comment box. And later after the discussion, we will have a question and answer portion in which Tito Job can answer your questions. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's start the discussion again with ILPS Chief Emeritus uh, Tito Job Season. Tito, magpulang pagbati po, kamusta po kayo? Uh, my, I wish to express warmest greetings to you, Angelo, to all our kababayan, especially those in the Philippines uh, who are suffering uh, from the natural disaster and the neglect uh, of the um, Duterte regime. Uh, I wish them the best. Uh, may they uh, be able to stand up and uh, 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 look after their own, their own uh, welfare through collective efforts uh, in solidarity with the entire Filipino people. All right. Tito, let's start the discussion. Um, uh, let's have this uh, first question of our um, discussion. Ano. Engels said that political economy is a historical science. What did he mean by that? Can you briefly explain what political economy is? Uh, according to Engels, political economy, in the widest sense, is the science of the laws 
governing the production and exchange of the material means of subsistence in human society. Production and exchange are two different functions. Production may occur without exchange, but exchange being uh, necessarily an exchange of products cannot occur without production. Each of these two social functions is subject to the action of external influences, which to a great extent are peculiar to it. And for this reason, each has also to a great extent its own special laws. But on the other hand, they constantly determine and influence each other. Political economy is therefore essentially a historical science. It deals with material, which is historical, that is constantly changing. It must first investigate the special laws of each individual stage in the evolution of production and exchange. And only when it has completed this investigation will it be able to establish the few quite general laws which hold good for production and exchange in general. At the same time, it goes without saying that the laws which are valid for definite modes of production and forms of exchange hold good for all historical periods in which these modes of production and forms of exchange prevail. During states, his position as follows. The relation between general politics and the forms of economic law is determined in so definite and at the same time so original a way that it would not be superfluous in order to facilitate study to make special reference to this point. The formation of political relationships is historically the fundamental fact and the economic conditions dependent on this are only an effect or a particular or a case and are consequently always facts of the second order. I see, Tito. During the belief that the political conditions are decisive cause of the economic situation, according to him, all economic phenomena uh, must be explained by political causes, that is, by force. So what does Engels has to say about this theory? To arrive at his theory of force, during hypothesizes that the cooperative relationship between Robinson Crusoe and his man Friday, who are stranded on an island, can become oppressive and exploitative, characterized by Crusoe's use of force against Friday. There is no apparent condition, motive or rationale why there is the resort to force, except as arbitrary or even malicious will, which either one of the two stranded men could have. At any rate, during arbitrarily blames Crusoe for committing the original sin of using force. And this is supposed to be the beginning of all subsequent oppression and exploitation in society. The implication is that the state as organized violence came ahead before the development of unequal and exploitative relations in the mode of production. During argues, nothing more than this simple dualism is required to enable us accurately to portray some of the most important relations of distribution and to study their laws in germ and their logical necessity. Cooperative working on an equal footing is here just as conceivable as the combination of forces through the complete subjection of one party who is then compelled to render economic service as a slave or as a mere tool and is maintained also only as a tool. A universal survey of the various historical institutions of justice and injustice is here the essential presupposition. Engels refutes during as follows. The question arises, how did Crusoe come to enslave Friday? Just for the pleasure of doing it? No such thing. On the contrary, we see that Friday is compelled to render economic service as a slave or as a mere tool and is maintained only as a tool. Crusoe enslaved Friday only in order that Friday should work for Crusoe's benefit. And how can Crusoe derive and be any benefit for himself from Friday's labor? Only through Friday producing by his labor more of the necessaries of life than Crusoe has to give him to keep him in a fit state of work to work. The childish example specifically selected by Herr During in order to prove that force is historically the fundamental fact in reality, therefore, proves that force is only the means and that the aim is economic advantage. And in, in as much as the aim is more fundamental 
than the means to secure it. So in history, the economic side of the relationship is much more fundamental than the political side. The example therefore proves precisely the opposite of what it was supposed to prove. I see. Was force the root of slavery and private property? Or why or why not? How about the development of capitalism from feudalism? Was it the political or the economical development that was decisive? Engels asserts that production and its development take precedence over the emergence of force as a means of social control. He declares, in order to make use of a slave, a man must possess two kinds of things. First, the instruments and material for his slave's labor, and secondly, the minimum necessaries of life for him. Therefore, before slavery becomes possible, a certain level of production must already have been reached and a certain inequality of distribution must already have appeared. Engels proceeded to show how inequality can arise in society without force. Historically, private property by no means makes its appearance as the result of robbery or violence. On the contrary, it already existed even though it was limited to certain objects in the ancient primitive communes of all civilized peoples. It developed within these communes at first through barter with, with strangers till it reached the form of commodities. The more the products of the commune assumed the commodity form, uh, that is, the less they were produced for their producer's own use and the more for the purpose of exchange, the more the primitive natural division of labor was replaced by exchange also within the commune, the more inequality developed in the property of the individual members of the commune. The use of iron tools, the growth of agriculture and animal breeding, and the emergence of a patriarchal system of private property in the late barbaric stage of the primitive communal society prepared the means for keeping captives as slaves instead of killing them and for instituting the slave system. The slave masters adopted feudalism as the more favorable system for them when the landed states expanded to an extent that it was difficult to manage the slaves and prevent them from running away. Thus, the slaves were converted to serfs due to the economic considerations. Capitalism grew within the womb of feudalism with the development of handicrafts, manufacturing, machines, commerce, and the growth of towns and cities. Before the bourgeoisie raised the flag of revolt against the feudal monarchy and aristocracy in France. In England and some other European countries, the bourgeoisie and the feudalists could compromise on a domestic balance of power and even collaborate in a colonial adventures in the furtherance of mercantile capitalism and further primitive accumulation of uh, capital and onwards to the era of modern imperialism. Tito, um, according to Engels, uh, force is condition economic situation which further which furnishes the means for the equipment and maintenance of the uh, instruments of force such as the army and navy so what example of the state collaborate with this engels takes note of the following crusoe and slave friday sword in hand from where did he get the sword even on the imaginary islands of crusoe stories swords have not up to now grown up grown and on trees and Herr Düring gives us no answer whatever to this question. If it's just a matter of finding a weapon, then Friday might just as easily have become the master and not the slave had he found a sword first, or better yet, a pistol. So then, the revolver triumphs over the sword, and this will probably make even the most childish axiomatician comprehend that force is no mere act of the will but requires very real preliminary conditions before it can come into operation. That is to say, instruments, the more perfect of which vanquish the less perfect. Moreover, uh, these instruments have to be produced, which also implies that the producer of more perfect instruments of force vanquishes the producer of the less perfect instrument. And that, in a word, the triumph of force is based on the production of arms, and this in turn on production in general, therefore on economic power and on the economic order. 
uh, on the material means which force has at, at its disposal. Uh, to make further fun out of during silly society of two men, let me comment that even if Friday would not find a pistol to overpower the sword uh, that uh, Friday need, uh, needed to exercise will, he can pretend to sleep. He can exercise, uh, fr Friday can exercise his will, pretend to sleep, and keep away until, uh, until uh, uh, Crusoe goes to sleep and he could grab the sword. Uh, uh, it, would, it takes more than the will to use force to be able to dominate a certain society or a number of countries, as in colonialism and imperialism. There is a prior requirement of having an army and navy which are equipped with the instruments of war produced by the economic system. Uh, at any rate, Engels declares, relations of domination arose not because someone decided one day to forcibly enslave someone else, but uh, as a product of material changes, the growth of human productivity, particularly with the rise of agriculture, both required and made possible a surplus that could sustain larger, more sedentary populations and a greater division of labor. The most significant division of labor was that between those who performed work and those entrusted by the society as a whole with guardianship over the surplus and over the maintenance of the necessary conditions of production. At the same moment, however, these functions aimed at serving society at large were transformed into positions of lordship over society. The guardians and dispensers of the surplus became the controllers and appropriators of the surplus, who then employed coercive means when necessary to maintain their control. Engels also operates during for considering force as an absolute evil, the original sin by which all problems of society can be explained. He points out that force can also play a positive role as the midwife of every old society pregnant with a new one, that it is the instrument with the aid of which social movement forces its way through and shatters the dead, fossilized political forms. Engels scores during in the following manner. It is only what it is uh, 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 not only um, uh, it is only with sighs and groans that during admits the possibility that force will perhaps be necessary for the overthrow of an economic system of exploitation. Unfortunately, because all use of force demoralizes the person who uses it, and this is in spite of the immense moral and spiritual impetus which has been given by every victorious revolution. I see, Tito. So uh, what is the Marxist theory, theory of value then? And what is the Durings theory of value, if, if there's any? Like Adam Smith and David Ricardo before the Marx and Engels teach us that the value of a commodity is the average labor time embodied by it or imparted to it by the workers. During gives us as many as five theories of value, the production value, which comes from nature, or the distribution value, which man's wickedness is created, and which is distinguished by the fact that it is measured by the expenditure of energy, which is not contained in it. Or thirdly, the value which is measured by labor time, or fourthly, the value which is measured by the cost of reproduction, or lastly, the value which is measured by wages. You do not have to remember all or any of these five conflicting theories and be confused by Dürings too many theories, which he offers like wild shots. He seems to hit the mark with one of the shots by mentioning value which is measured by labor time. But Engels points out, in so far as there is a meaning in this, it is the value of a product of labor is determined by the labor time necessary for its production. And we knew that long ago even without hair during. Instead of stating the fact simply, he has to twist it into an oracular saying. It is simply wrong to say that the dimensions in which anyone invests his energies in anything to keep to the bombastic style is the immediate determining cause of value and of the magnitude of value. In the first place, it depends on what thing the energy is put into 
and secondly, how the energy is put into it. If someone, if someone makes a, a thing which has no use value for other people, his whole energy does not produce an atom of value. And if he is stiff-necked enough to produce by hand an object, which is a machine, produces 20 times cheaper, 19, uh, 19 20 eighths of the energy put into it produces neither value in general nor any particular magnitude of value. Tito, uh, why is Deering's critic of Marx on simple and compound labor incorrect? According to Deering, Marx's theory of value is nothing but the ordinary theory that labor is the cause of all values and labor time is the measure. But the question of how the distinct value of so-called skilled labor is to be conceived is left in complete obscurity. It is true that in our theory, also, on the labor time expended can be the measure of the natural cost and therefore of the absolute value of economic things. But here the value, the labor time of each individual must be considered absolutely equal to start with. And it is only necessary to examine where in skilled production the labor time of other persons, for example, in the tool used, is added to the separate labor time of the individual. Engels refutes during as follows. Marx is examining what it is that determines the value of commodities and gives the answer. The human labor embodied in them. This, she continues, is the expenditure of simple labor power, which on an average, apart from any special development, exists in the organism of every ordinary individual. Skilled labor counts only as simple labor intensified or rather as multiplied simple labor, a given quantity of skill being considered equal to a greater quantity of simple labor. Experience shows that this reduction is constantly being made. A commodity may be the product of the most skilled labor, but its value by equating it to the product of simple unskilled labor represents a definite quantity of the latter labor for labor alone. The different proportions in which different sorts of labor are reduced to unskilled labor as their standard are established by a social process that goes on beyond the backs of the producers and consequently appear to be fixed by custom. Marx is dealing here, first of all, only with the determination of the value of commodities, meaning to say of objects which, within a society composed of private producers, are produced and exchanged against each other by these private producers for their private account. In this passage, therefore, there is no question whatever of absolute value, wherever this may be in existence, but of the value which is current in a definite form of society. This value in this definite historical sense is shown to be created and measured by the human labor embodied in the individual commodities. And this human labor is further shown to be the expenditure of simple labor power. But not all labor is a simple expenditure of simple human labor power. Very many sorts of labor involve the use of capabilities or knowledge acquired with the expenditure of greater or lesser effort, time and money. Do these kinds of compound labor produce in the same interval of time the same commodity values as simple labor? the expenditure of bare simple labor power? Obviously not. The product of one hour of compound labor is a commodity of a higher value, perhaps double or treble, in comparison with the product of one hour of simple labor. The values of the products of compound labor are expressed by this comparison in definite quantities of, of simple labor. But this reduction of compound labor is established by social process which goes on behind the backs of the producers by a process which at this point uh, in the development of the theory of value can only be stated but not as yet explained. I see, Dito. How does During misrepresented Marx and how does Engels explain what is capital and how it grows by extracting surplus value? During misrepresents Marx in the following words. To begin with, Herr Marx does not 
hold the accepted economic view of capital, namely that it is a means of production already produced. On the contrary, he tries to, to get up a more special dialectical historical idea that toys with metamorphosis of concepts and history. According to him, capital is born of money. It forms a historical phase of opening with the 16th century, that is, with the first beginnings of a world market, which presumably appeared at that period. Engels refutes the misrepresentation of Marx by during by explaining what is capital and surplus value. In the analysis Marx makes of the economic forms within which the process of the circulation of commodities takes place, money appears as a final form. This final product of the circulation of commodities is the first form in which capital appears. As a result, of, as a matter of history, capital, as opposed to landed property, invariably takes the form at first of money. It appears as moneyed wealth as the capital of the merchant and of the user. We can see it daily under our very eyes. All new capital to commence with comes on the stage that is on the market, whether of commodities, labor, or money, even in our days, in the shape of money that by a definite process has to be transformed into capital. Here once again, Marx is stating a fact, unable to dispute it, her during distorted capital he has, Marx say, is born of money. Marx then investigates the processes by which money is transformed into capital and finds first that the form in which money circulates as capital is the inversion of the form in which it circulates as the general equivalent of commodities. The simple owner of commodities sells in order to, to buy. He sells what he does not need, and with the money thus procured, he buys what he does need. The incipient capitalist starts by buying what he does not need himself. He buys in order to sell and to sell at a higher price, in order to get back the value of the money originally thrown into the transaction, augmented by an increment in money. And Marx calls this increment surplus value. Whence comes the surplus value? It cannot come from either come either from the buyer buying the commodities under their value or from the sellers selling them above their value. For in both cases, the gains and the losses of each individual cancel each other, as each individual is in turn buyer and seller. Nor can it come from cheating, for the cheating can enrich one person at the expense of another. It cannot increase the total sum possessed by both. And therefore cannot augment the sum of the values in circulation. The capitalist class as a whole in any country cannot overreach themselves. And yet we find that in each country, the capitalist class as a whole is continuously enriching itself before our eyes by selling dearer than it had bought, by appropriating to itself surplus value. We are therefore just where we were at the start. Whence comes the surplus value? This problem must be solved, and it must be solved in a purely economic way, excluding all cheating and the intervention of any force. The problem being, how is it possible constantly to sell dearer than one has bought, even on the hypothesis that equal values are always exchanged for equal values? The solution of this problem is the most epoch-making achievement of Marx's work. It spread the clear light of day through economic domains in which socialists no less than bourgeois economists previously groped in utter darkness. Scientific socialism dates from the discovery of the solution and has been built up around it. Tito, how does this Marxist theory on capital and surplus value? During it describes as earnings of capital the entirety of the surplus value created by labor power and he proceeds to misinterpret surplus value in the following way. In Herr Marx's view, wages represent only the payment of that labor time during which the laborer is actually working to make his own existence possible. But only a small number of hours is required for this purpose. All the rest of the working day, often so prolonged, yields a surplus in which is contained what our author calls surplus value, or express in everyday language, the earnings of capital. 
If we leave out of account the labor time, which at each stage of production is already contained in the instruments of labor and in the pertinent raw material, this surplus part of the working day is the share which falls to the capitalist entrepreneur. The prolongation of the working day is consequently earnings of pure exploitation for the benefit of the capitalist. Engels immediately tells her during that Marx surplus values not just profit or the earnings of capital. It includes profit, but includes other parts, such as rent and interest. He quotes from Marx, the capitalist who produces surplus value, meaning to say who extracts unpaid labor directly from the laborers and fixes it in commodities, is indeed the first appropriator but by no means the ultimate owner of the surplus value. He has to share it with capitalists, with landowners who fulfill other functions in the complex of social production. Surplus value therefore splits up into various parts. Its fragments fall to various categories of persons and take various forms independent of the one, independent uh, uh, of from one or the other, such as profit, interest, merchants, profit, rent, and so on. Marx also points out as one of Ricardo's main shortcomings in his study of value that he has not investigated surplus value as such, meaning to say independently of its particular forms such as profit, rent, etc., and that he therefore lumps together the laws of the rate of surplus value and the loss of the rate of profit. So what is the popularity of land rent in that time? You know, what is Doring's idea about land rent and how the different rentals? Engels points out the idea of land rent is a part of political economy, which is specifically English and necessary to show because it was only in England that there existed a mode of production under which rent had in fact been separated from profit and interest. In England, as is well known, large landed estates and large-scale agriculture predominate. The landlords leased their land in large, often very large farms to tenant farmers who possess sufficient capital to work them, and unlike our peasants, do not work themselves out, but employ the labor of hands and day. D laborers on the lines of full-pledged capitalist entrepreneurs. Here, therefore, we have the three classes of bourgeois society and the form of income peculiar to each. The landlord drawing rent of land, the capitalist drawing profit, and the laborer drawing wages. It has never occurred to any English economist to regard the farmer's earnings as a kind of wages, as seems to her during to be the case. Even less could it be hazardous for such an economist to assert that the farmer's profit is what it indisputably, obviously, and tangibly is, namely a profit on capital. It is perfectly ridiculous to say that the question of what the farmer's earnings actually are has never been raised in this definite form. In England, there has never been any necessity even to raise this question. Both question and answer have been available, derived from the facts themselves. And since Adam Smith, there has never been any doubt about them. Engels make fun of the so-called fundamental laws that Mr. During claimed to have discovered. Law number one, the productivity of the economic instruments, natural resources and human energy and increase, is increased by inventions and discoveries. Law number two, division of labor, the cleaving of trades and the dissection of activities raises the productivity of labor. Uh, law number three, distance and transport are the chief causes which hinder or facilitate the cooperation of the productive forces. Law number four, the industrial state uh, has an incomparably greater population capacity than the agricultural state. And law number five, in the economy, nothing takes place without a material interest. Engels dismisses these so-called laws as mere platitudes, referring to facts that have been known, recognized and spelled out by so many long before, during, could acclaim them as his original discoveries. 
And Engels ridicules them as axioms that cannot serve as the foundation of the scientific study of political economy, as previously proclaimed by Turing. He then proceeds to expose Turing's ignorance of English capitalist farming and his misunderstanding of the concept and theory of land rent. Herr Turing comes up against both English farmers' profit and the division based on English farming and recognized by all classical political economy of that surplus product into rent of land and farmers' profit, and uh, hence against the pure, precise conception of rent. What does Herr Turing do? He pretends not to have the slightest inkling of the division of the surplus product of agriculture into uh, capitalist farmers' profit and rent, and therefore of the whole rent theory of classical political economy. He pretends that the question of what farmers' profit really is has never yet been raised in this definite form. That the issue is a subject which has never yet been investigated and about which there is no knowledge, but only illusion and uncertainty. The overall and final Engels analysis of Durings' very own system of political economy. Engels declares the following conclusively. What then is the final result of our analysis of Turing's very own system of political economy? Nothing except the fact that with all the great words and the still more mighty promises, we are just as much duped as we were in the philosophy. Part one, not meant to Turing. And the theory of value, the touchstone of the world of economic systems, amounts to this, that by value, Herr Turing understands five totally different and directly contradictory things, and therefore, to put it at its best, himself does not know what he wants. The natural laws of all economics, ushered in with such pomp, prove to be merely universally familiar and often not even properly understood platitudes of the worst description. The sole explanation of economic facts, which his very own system can give us, is that they are the result of force a term with which the Philistine of all nations has for thousands of years consoled himself for everything unpleasant that happens to him, and which leaves us just where we were. Instead, however, of investigating the origin and effects of this force, Herr Düring expects us to content ourselves gratefully with the mere word force as the last final cause and ultimate explanation of all economic phenomena. Compelled further to elucidate capitalist exploitation of labor, he first represents it in a general way as based on taxes and price surcharges, thereby completely appropriating the Proudhonian reduction, uh, and then proceeding to explain it in detail by means of Marxist theory of surplus value, surplus product, and surplus value. In this way, he manages to bring about a happy reconciliation of two totally contradictory modes of outlook by copying down both without taking his breath. And just as in philosophy, he could not find enough hard words for the very Hegel whom he was so constantly exploiting and at the same time emasculating. So in the Kritische Geschichte, the most baseless calumniation of uh, Marx only serves to conceal the fact that everything in the courses about capital and labor, which makes any sense at all, is likewise an emasculated plagiarism of Marx. His ignorance, which in the courses puts the large landowner at the beginning of the history of the civilized peoples, and knows not a word of the common ownership of land in the tribal and village communities, which is the real starting point of all history. This ignorance at the present day, almost incomprehensible, is well nigh surpassed by the ignorance, which in the Kritische Geschichte thinks not little of, little of itself because of the universal breadth of its historical survey, and of which we have given only a few deterrent examples. In a word, first the colossal effort of self-admiration of charlatan blast on his own trumpet, of promises each surpassing the other, and then the result exactly nil or zero.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Tito, for uh, teaching us um, those um, following words. Uh, to our audience, we are now opening our question and answer floor. So if you have questions in mind during the discussion, you can now drop it on our comment box so Tito Joe could answer it for you. So while we are waiting, uh, we were just going to go through a quick break so uh, we could have a breather at least and uh, while we wait for your question. So um, uh, here is a short video from Outer Media. Lahat lahat was out ang bahay. Wala ka talaga, wala talagang pinatawad ng UNICEF. Yung lahat ng mga tao, hindi walang tulog. Dalawang gabi kami walang tulog hanggang ngayon. Walang trabaho, walang pasok-pasok. Naghanap kami ng mamakain kaya kami nagpipila kahit saan-saan. Wala kahit pagkain namin, nagtiis kami ng gabi na yun. Nag magtiis kami na may mag may makatulong magdala ng pagkain. Wala sir. Isang gabi at kalahating araw wala kami kinain tubig. Wala pang tubig sir. Ang bahay namin, may madumi hanggang ngayon, walang tubig supply dito sa amin. Tawa ng Diyos kanina, may naghatid na nawasa, na truck. Yun, nakatikim kami ng tubig, igib-igib. Mamaya daw po, nabalik na naman sila. At sobra pong hirap ng mga tao dito. Mahirap na nga ang buhay, gawa sa pandemya. unang pagronda ng ambulansya na ano mobile, nagronda sila maganda, tapos yung pangalawang ikot lumikas na nag-advance na kami, umalis na kami agad wala nang sabi-sabi kaya kung sino nananawagan kami kung sino may puso na gustong tumulong sa amin sa natulungan kami Yeah. 
kalayaan mo na rito Sa kalayaan mo na rito So uh, currently, as we open this uh, program, uh, we 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 gave our clothes to families and um, uh, our Kababayans who have uh, been victims and uh, from the recent calamity that has struck our country. So now uh, we are introducing, um, we are currently gathering a fundraising to help our Kababayans back home. So the Philippines is not a stranger to natural calamities. Early this year, the Philippines endured the Taal volcano eruption as if to conclude 2020. Two of the strongest typhoons of the year hit the country in less than two weeks. Um, um, in less than two weeks. Typhoon Rolly and Typhoon Ulysses on top of that. The Philippines has the highest rate of coronavirus spread in the entire Southeast Asian region and one of the most impoverished um, impoverished nations to survive most of the Filipinos of the out to abroad, resulting to at least 12% of the country's population to be overseas. That is around nearly 12 to 15 million Filipinos in 184 countries and territories. COVID-19 has taken away what little the Filipinos and families have, that it has been aggravated by the catastrophes that struck the Philippines a few weeks before Christmas. Various towns um, and cities are either buried under the mud or swimming in flood. The Gayan Valley, for instance, is in, in inundated with flood water up to 4.5 meters high, while the Bicol region, which barely had time to recover from Typhoon Rodi, has been hit by Typhoon Ulysses. As Filipinos youth in Europe, we would like to aid raise funds for victims of typhoon in various areas for the country is not only facing the consequences of the typhoon but also COVID-19 pandemic. Food, hygiene, medical supplies, underwear, clothes, drinking water, disinfectant, sanitizer, mask, etc. Et continue to be a necessity for the victims and volunteers similarly. Christmas is the most important season for many Filipinos. However, the food and the pandemic is the opportunity of migrants and their families uh, to be together. As migrants, it pains us to see our country in such conditions while we are caught in our bed at night, completely dry and standing on solid ground. Many migrant workers won't be of help to their family as Europe is facing unemployment uh, concerning lockdowns. Proceeds will go to Bayang Matulungin Relief Operations, a group of volunteers who were one of the first responders throughout the calamity and has various connections in the Philippines. They are also at the forefront of upholding the rights of the Filipinos and educating the people on the impact of climate injustice in the Philippines, usually endorsed by international mining companies and the foreign corporations. So if you do have any anything to donate, uh, if you have an extra there that you could donate to help our clients, uh, the bank details and um, the directions to donate is located at our live video. So you can just uh, go to the description and you can see the the bank account that you could transfer your funds to or the PayPal link that you could donate online. We know the difficulty 2020 has brought upon us, but as citizens and residents of the first world, we are still advantages to be and to be and blessed. No, thank you so much. So again, we will now go back to our main discussion in which we will have a question and answer portions. Again, our questions and answer floor is still open. So you have, if you do have questions in mind, just drop it down in the comment box so Tito Jo could answer it. Tito Jo, um, are you ready for our question and answer? Uh, uh, Tinakon na kung are you ready for our question? Ah, yes, after? yes. Sorry, Tito, na ako ata ang inyong um, camera. 
Ano yun? Naka-off po ata yung camera niya po. Ah, naka-off? Na, an- naka-on na ba ako? Apo, okay na po. Alright. Naka, naka-off daw yung camera natin kanina. Huh? Na, naka-on na. Sige, yeah. ano? Alright. Okay. Uh, I'll be throwing uh, my first question yeah. from our audience. Ano? Uh, that will be, how harmful are Doring's analysis of political economy to the workers' emancipation? Well, the uh, Doring's analysis of political economy is harmful to the working class movement because uh, first, in, it uh, uh, confuses um, uh, uh, certain basic uh, concepts uh, already provided by Marx about um, um, the creation of value by uh, labor power. Uh, commodities uh, embody uh, the uh, labor time necessary to produce it. No? And um, uh, uh, during confuses this and uh, 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 Marx uh, gives the truth and at the same time gives honor to the workers who create uh, new material values in the um, uh, capitalist mode of production, uh, in the creation of uh, uh, commodities. And the second point is that uh, he preaches against force, all kinds of force, and he wrongly attributes the development of the economy uh, to, uh, uh, to force. And, uh, and that is not true, according to uh, to Engels. Um, and uh, the problem with uh, uh, just condemning uh, force as a uh, the uh, main thing, uh, preconditioning any uh, development of production is that uh, well, um, there is moral condemnation, but uh, there is no understanding of it, and a, there is an obscuring of the uh, real process of economic development. And uh, with this moral condemnation of force uh, in the abstract and in general, uh, then force as a way by which the working class can overthrow uh, the uh, the bourgeoisie uh, is laid aside. So it breeds uh, reformism. So uh, uh, there are two uh, objectionable uh, points. Uh, against the position of Turing. He confuses uh, uh, fundamental concepts of Marxism regarding um, um, value of commodities and also uh, how uh, um, uh, surplus value is created uh, with uh, uh, the divisibility of this uh, divisibility of this uh, surplus uh, value into uh, profit for the uh, capitalist entrepreneur and uh, uh, the merchant, uh, rent for the landlord, and interest for the banks. Uh, he he says all these are uh, earnings of capital. So, uh, but uh, the worst kind of uh, obfuscation, of course, is you know uh, denying uh, the fact that workers. Uh, use their labor power in order to create the commodities uh, that are for use and for exchange. And now, uh, reformism is the outcome uh, of, let's say, uh, condemning all sorts of force. Uh, force is something that you can command uh, uh, for the benefit of the people. It is a force. Force can be used against the people, against the proletariat and the people, but you have also to use force in order to free uh, the uh, workers and the people from uh, oppression. And it's not true that uh, force uh, is the um, uh, is the motive force uh, preceding uh, a higher economic development. The, the, the uh, a development of a higher stage uh, is due to economic factors. Uh, and it does not mean, you know, uh, just uh, someone or a group uh, imposing uh, its will on the, on the people uh, uh, with the use of force. It doesn't work that way. Um, uh, the uh, uh, private ownership 
of the means of production started uh, initially as uh, you know uh, the reward for the uh, uh, pairing family uh, that would become father centered and then uh, it was with their own uh, work that they uh, you know opened the, the farm uh, and uh, bred the animals and so on so uh, there was a there was the work common work of the family and before that it would be um, the work of the entire clan or the entire uh, uh, tribe no so uh, within the productive community there is no forcing uh, but then came the institu institutionalizing of uh, patriarchy uh, uh, private property and the system of inheritance so and then of course in the um, fighting of the tribes in the late barbaric stage of the primitive communal uh, society um, when uh, it, conditions were ripe for the slave system, so um, the winning tribes in wars would think of uh, preserving the lives of the captives rather than killing the captives so that they could be put to work as slaves. So and that was some kind of an improvement on barbarism, uh, but it led to slavery. All right. Thank you, Dito. Um, next question naman from our audience would be, was there any followers or movement influenced by Durings political economy analysis in the Philippine revolutionary movement? Well, in the in time the of time. Engels, uh, it was worrisome. Um, Engels called the attention of Marx that uh, uh, so many members and even leaders like Liebknecht and uh, others in the German uh, uh, German uh, uh, Social Demo Democratic Party uh, were impressed by uh, uh, by Durin. Um but after uh, uh, Engels uh, smashed uh, Durin, uh, uh, you know it, it, it's quite uh, uh, you know by reading anti Durin you can see that uh, Durin was quite a pompous guy, you know, using big words. He he liked to string up big words. But actually, a great deal of it was, uh, a great deal of the words were nonsense, no? And uh, he, 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 he was, uh, well, uh, uh, we've gone through the process of uh, presenting uh, uh, Engels' reputations. After the smashing of during by, uh, by Engels, uh, during became nothing. He would, be, he would come to be down up to now only because of the book. Uh, against him, anti during <laughs> and um, so among workers in the working class movement and uh, among uh, uh, communists, uh, he, he has become nothing. Uh, and uh, the bourgeoisie uh, would not also would not also use him as an authority um, because there are better authorities for the bourgeois. Um, yeah. Just imagine that, um, uh, you know, in, in liberal economics, uh, uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo accept uh, uh, the principle that value comes um, from the labor power or labor in the course of making uh, commodities. And uh, 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 during, uh, uh, does not have to be the one uh, well, during is completely useless to the bourgeoisie in that regard. Uh, maybe among the neoliberals, but I think the neoliberals uh, who who would uh, who would have uh, uh, who would worship the market 100 uh, percent uh, with no consideration of the real production done by the by the workers. But uh, uh, the neoliberals uh, uh, who uh, who came up uh, in the 1930s would have more authorities among themselves no? that would uh, uh, serve them as uh, a point of reference. So even to the bourgeoisie, uh, during has become useless as uh, some kind of authority or as a, as a point of reference. I see. Tito, next question, man, would be, uh, does the revolutionary movement use violent force 
to advance the interests of the people if then is it just to do so? The revolutionary movement uses uh, force because in the first place, um, uh, the exploiting class uses force, the state, which is an organized, uh, uh, which is the organi organization of violence uh, against uh, the people, the working class and the, and the people. So uh, for socialism to be established, uh, there is no way but for the working class to overthrow uh, the, the state power of the bourgeoisie. So, you know, in, uh, in the strictly Marxist terms, uh, the, the class dictatorship uh, of, uh, of the bourgeoisie, which you can simply state the capitalist state, has to be overthrown by uh, the class dictatorship of the proletariat or uh, what uh, 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 worker state uh, uh, that needs to be established in order to um, uh, do away completely with the with the bourgeois state. So um, uh, the the emergence of uh, a revolutionary movement is preceded by oppression and exploitation uh, uh, through methods of exploitation and uh, uh, political methods under the rubric of state power against them. So uh, it, it is uh, just and reasonable, reasonable for the workers themselves uh, to apply the necessary force in order to do away with the oppressive uh, bourgeois state. And, um, you know, the uh, communist um, or proletarian revolutionaries do not monopolize, do not, uh, the issue or the, the use of force. They do not. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it, is, uh, it is essential in the, uh, in, in the concept of uh, uh, democracy that the people uh, have the sovereign will and they, they can use any means by which to do away with oppression and tyranny. At that point, it has been well established in the liberal democratic uh, revolution in France. And that has been, that is a principle contained in all democratic constitutions that the people have the sovereign uh, uh, will and, the, and power to do away with any government or state that becomes oppressive and uh, tyrannical. That's, uh, you can read that uh, in the, in the American Declaration of Independence and in the American Constitution and even in the unwritten Constitution of England, that's clear, no? Although historically England has been the place where the, the, the bourgeoisie and the monarchy uh, compromised and uh, um, very quietly uh, the bourgeoisie uh, adapted to the new uh, system uh, by banking on its control of land, no? And uh, uh, up to now uh, that uh, control of land uh, is developed into financial power. No, uh, the, uh, the royal family has uh, uh, huge financial and uh, interest and uh, interest in industries, uh, but that's all founded on its feudal uh, history and uh, feudal possessions. So. Um, uh, the revolutionary movement uh, comes only as a response to the prior violence of the exploiting and oppressing class. That's the logic of, uh, and uh, it's not only a matter of logic, it's a matter of necessity, uh, because uh, the proletariat and the people will continue to be oppressed and exploited if they do not get rid of that state power which uh, oppresses them. I see. Ito. Anyway, before we proceed to the fourth question, Dito, um, and while we are still waiting for the questions to be sent through from the audience, uh, we would just like to plug again. Uh, we are conducting a fundraising event for um, victims of typhoon Ulysses and the recent typhoons that have struck our country. If you um, do have anything uh, there extra, no, you could donate it to the bank details on our live videos as well as there's a PayPal link there that you could donate online again. And also to if you want to help um, um, activists and um, our uh, co comrades here in, in, in Europe, I know you could order books 
toward um, Filipino uh, foreign language press ano so uh, makikita uh, you can order books at FL Press um, flpress.storenv.com no there is a lot of books being sold there um, um, from uh, from Mao Zedong to uh, Lenin to Marx and other philo- um, revolutionary uh, thinkers ano po at ayan so um ito will um will we have a uh, one questions from all our audience ano Ito yung question niya. Ready na po ba tayo dito? Uh, if I may reduce, can you read the, the question? Uh, it's quite long, no? You can, is- probably, you can reduce it. Can the capitalism persist uh, eternally or indefinitely? And, um, and it also um, puts a burden on socialism as something, um, something that uh, may be... Uh, put aside <laughs> because some, it's not so good after all. Something like that. All right. Tita, as you Tita, we'll try to reword. Uh, anyway, it. you can read the entire. You can give the entire question. All right. Tita, I'll read the question. Um. Uh. So uh, this question is from one of our audiences, um, Ash Sulaiman. It is. Um, uh, my question would be: It it is called a sub um a subjective force. This proletarian revolution. Suppose a perfectly intelligent ruling class, can they theoretically extend capitalism to infinity through all means, even though to technological, materialistic, and or political maneuvers regime concessions in game theoretic sense, all uh, to let capitalism prevail? So how do we make sense of determinism of Marxism? Also, is it conceivable coming from capitalist experience this vanishing of greed, even a human nature as some thinkers call it, or perhaps does it become irrelevant in light of the economic system and the laws and relations, say of a fair, tasteless, equal society that govern people's lives, say socialism to communism? You know, there is nothing deterministic uh, about uh, Marxism, even when it uh, um, uh, refers to the uh, uh, decisive importance of economic development as the material basis for social development. It does not uh, have any kind of uh, timetable uh, and necessary uh, uh, result of uh, uh, economic changes towards socialism or anything else. Because in uh, society, you have three aspects. No, um, you have the economic. Uh, uh, foundation uh, of society, people have to produce uh, the things for their subsistence. That's something basic. That's how uh, important the material base is for society. Uh, and then there you have the political aspect and the cultural aspect. And there are many uh, uh, taking these three uh, together, even when you have already a socialist society, uh, the, the comp- there is a complexity, interactivity interactions of these different aspects. So the the complexity rises when the working class is not yet in power and the the bourgeoisie uh, makes use of all these aspects of uh, society. For instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, workers uh, tend to follow the the, the capitalist boss because, you know, uh, some of the workers even think that they will not survive if they did not behave according to the rules of the capitalist, no? So you have even at the level of, uh, uh, of uh, the relations of production, the workers are at a disadvantage if they did not, if they, if they, if everyone would just think for, for himself or herself and there is no rise of collective consciousness uh, of uh, the class for itself, uh, you have workers subject to the will of the capitalist. And then, even when you have a big, a strong uh, working class movement uh, with trade unions, they have to raise their level of political consciousness because you have priorly a more developed uh, political system and political institutions of the bourgeois ruling class. And then the cultural also, the accumulation of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of culture in which the institution of private property in the means of production uh, is uh, 
uh, for instance, justified in terms of uh, uh, the rules of God, no? And or uh, uh, and you have all sophisticated ways of uh, of uh, you know uh, glorifying private ownership of the means of production in, in very direct or indirect terms. So uh, you you have that kind of complexity, and uh, it will not to uh, to think eh? one is not a Marxist if uh, one only believes in a one uh, uh, in a uh, on a straight line development of history or having a uh, 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 a one-way street, no? One-way street <laughs> from uh, the development uh, of uh, the means of production under capitalism straight to socialism? No, you're going to have a lot of zigzags because you have a powerful enemy. So, um, but let me review um, the development of uh, human society. Um, you know, it took some millions if you, if you just consider the... Uh, Homo erectus, yeah? uh, that's already more than a million years of uh, primitive communal life. Huh? Um, and then in the period, let's just consider uh, homo, homo sapiens sapiens of the last 60, uh, 60 years. No? Uh, that's a long period of time. But when the means of production were developed in the later part of barbarism, in the later part of uh, the... Um, Yes, that's the last uh, stage before slavery. Uh, that's only about 6,000 years ago when uh, uh, metallurgy, you know, there are three things that uh, made possible civilization. Uh, it is, uh, um, it is uh, uh, production, uh, graduating from stone tools uh, with the development of metallurgy. And then you have literacy. And then eventually you have class struggle. Uh, those are the motive forces in historical development. Uh, the, the, the means of production uh, can so develop um, that uh, a new social formation would arise. Uh, and, um, and that's because uh, uh, people make use of literacy yeah, and uh, means of, uh, under, of common understanding in order to, um, to opt for a new system. And then you have class struggle at work. I'll give you an example. For instance, the metal tools made possible slavery. Uh, uh, the shift from barbarism to slavery. Now, with the use of tools, uh, 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 the land will be plowed huh, with uh, uh, iron shares, no? And, uh, and it, uh, uh, so many things can be done with um, being able to cut trees and so on and so forth. Anyway, with the expansion of the uh, latifundias, uh, and then um, there would be, as in terms of European history, the Germanic tribes especially, and the other tribes, the Celtic and the, and the Slavic, uh, resisted the Roman Empire. And... Um, uh, and then uh, the slaves in the latifundias of Rome uh, could easily run away. And so, you know, the ration system in the slave system did not work. So uh, the, uh, the slave masters had to think of a new way of, um, of controlling uh, the workforce, the slave workforce. And the way was to turn them into serfs. Uh, to give them some stakes in staying on the land. And so they were given first the illusion of owning their own pieces of land uh, on which they can work for certain days, and on other days they work on the lands of the of the of the landlord. So uh, you will see that um, uh, these changes occur. And um, by the way, uh, there was a combination of uh, certain cultural factors and, of course, the continuing resistance of the Germanic tribes, uh, which were, uh, uh, which was uh, very uh, um, decisive. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, Christianity on, well, was on the side of Rome as well as on the side of the uh, barbaric tribes. You know? And uh, when the barbaric tribes um, finally were able to destroy uh, the power of Rome, 
uh, Christianity played a role in uh, uh, promoting uh, feudalism. And even the monks were good at uh, uh, opening up the land and using, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they're credited with the use of deep plow, uh, deep plowing uh, as a, uh, a big development of, of agriculture in the feudal system. So you have all these uh, variable, variables and uh, it is not Marxism just to think uh, you, you uh, see, uh, you, in Marxism you can see how in the last six years uh, civilization has developed so fast. It took some, uh, how many thousands of years to have slavery and, uh, and feudalism, even up to now. Even up to only the 19th century, up to uh, 20th century in the U.S., uh, in, in the Americas, there is the, the use of uh, slavery. But, you know, it is as if, uh, it is, it is as if uh, you have some geological formations, you know, um, layers of the past jut into the present, no? So, um, American capitalism developed uh, uh, with the use of... Uh, um, slaves and serfs, the black slaves and the and the poor white slaves, uh, poor white serfs, to produce the cotton and other things that England needed. And uh, the American capitalists would use the agricultural surplus to import equipment from England and and other parts of Europe. So, but uh, in general, you see how fast capitalism in. Uh, that took the form that was based on handicrafts uh, in, in, in the 13th century. Uh, uh, capitalism, which developed in Italy in connection with the Mediterranean trade, that was um, uh, 13th century. Then the big development, the next the big development would be uh, the um, the rise of complete manufacturing countries, but yet not yet with uh, large machines, you know. Um, you see, the Netherlands was the first, and England also uh, was close behind in developing manufacturing, you know, developing textile, building ships, and so on and so forth. And um, then uh, industrial capitalism would have its beginnings in France and England, and that was only in the, uh, that was only in the late uh, second half of the 18th century. Then uh, 19th century, you, you have the full sum, uh, full sum industrial revolution. Um, so, uh, if you, you will see the cumulative uh, advance of uh, civilization uh, coming up to um, capitalism and uh, up to the era of imperialism. The era of imperialism began only in the, in the 20th uh, uh, century. But because uh, uh, imperialism uh, is such a vicious outgrowth of capitalism, um, in so short a time, uh, you have, we have uh, seen um, a big crisis that resulted in world wars. And the first world war produced the first well, became the con provided the condition for the rise of uh, of the first socialist country, and then uh, uh, came the second world war. Uh, we would have several uh, capitalist countries, including China, no, and uh, and then the international liberation movements. So at at one time, 1956, it could be said one third of humanity, but. As I said, <laughs> there is no straight line to the world victory of socialism. Modern revisionism arose within the Soviet Union. <laughs> and uh, uh, Pitt the Six, uh, Khrushchev rose, and, uh, and then, uh, well, you know what happened, no? in so short a time, in just, uh, the, 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 to put it briefly, uh, socialism in the Soviet Union uh, ran up from uh, 1917 to 1956, strictly speaking, no? And then in China, uh, 1949 to 76. Now you, one might say, oh, this proves the uh, over-optimism or even the determinism of Marxist, 
No. Uh, you know, uh, uh, serious students of history will show that the capitalists did not uh, advance uh, to world hegemony uh, without taking a zigzag. Where uh, the bourgeois, where, where the bourgeoisie directly took power in, in France, you know, uh, in just a few years, uh, the uh, what was called the French terror became a reason for the Thermidorian reaction by which uh, Napoleon, Napoleon took power and instead of, you know, the rights of man in liberal democratic terms, uh, you know, dominating society, uh, well, they, in the first place, in the, the bourgeoisie took the rugs of the poor as their flag, but at the same time, uh, the bourgeoisie would install a new system of exploitation. But anyway, uh, worse than that, after the uh, French terror, the Napoleonic reaction and uh, Napoleonic uh, empire building would occur. So you will see that um, then you have the restoration of the monarchy. Um, so it's not only socialism uh, that suffers some setbacks, even while, uh, even after taking power. Yeah. Also, the bourgeoisie uh, took uh, a big retreat uh, in, in just a matter of years. Um, well, not even, not even uh, uh, after a decade. Um, the liberal democratic revolution was reversed. And in France, it would only be in the 20th century uh, when the rights of man would be uh, sort of fulfilled within the bourgeois democratic frame. Huh? So uh, in France itself, for, um, where uh, the liberal democratic capitalism was supposed to, to develop on a straight line, it did not. It took a long detour. Uh, practically the entirety of the, of the 19th century, um, uh, there was the capitalist, there was the uh, restoration, and it would only be in the, uh, in the early decades of the 20th century where the right of suffrage would be followed. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. uh, history takes zigzags, you know? even yeah. as in general terms, uh, the advances may be cumulative, especially when you consider basic changes. And um, uh, I think uh, historical development is quite rapid, no? Uh, since the time that capitalism became uh, um, became uh, dominant, uh, the the speed of history has been quite uh, 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 rapid, and uh, uh, you can imagine. Uh, we're just away in less than two centuries. There was colonialism was reigning all over the world and how colonialism was using all sorts of uh, exploitative practices, including slavery and uh, uh, serfdom. At the same time, it was part, uh, colonialism was a method of primitive accum accumulation of capital. And uh, that aspect of colonialism would... Uh, promote uh, the rise of certain industrial capitalist countries and bring us to the era of imperialism. I think uh, uh, when oppression and exploitation rises, you know, uh, those, the oppressors and exploiters do a service to the revolution. Huh? If Tsarism uh, was not so harsh, um, they tried to be soft, after the 1905 revolution in Russia, but uh, it combined both reformism and, you know, um, violent, uh, uh, e e but eventually it proved to be so, so uh, oppressive and violent. And so the Bolsheviks won. And uh, I think the Filipino people would have to uh, thank Duterte if he uh, if he's hard-headed enough to, to continue to to try to rule beyond 2022, I think in a sense, huh? uh, he will provoke a big revolution. Um, and um, uh, tyrants also play a role in the, in the making of, <laughs> of, uh, of history. Uh, tyrants uh, at first take advantage of the crisis, but as they, you know, abuse the people, they compel the people to fight back and make revolution. Uh, that's why Duterte, for instance, is uh, praised 
as uh, uh, the number one recruiter of the NPA because of the barbarism of Duterte, uh, his cruelty, his extrajudicial killings. Um, he is actually inspiring people to join the armed revolution than just be killed by Sinas, uh, Danau, and all those killers of Duterte. So, uh, uh, thanks to Duterte, the revolutionary movement is becoming stronger in the Philippines. They're finding more reason, Tito, to join. Anyway, Tito, I think uh, this is the last questions that have been sent from our audience. Unfortunately for our audience, we were now closing our floor for the question and answer. Um, thank you so much for participating. So, Tito, for the last question from our audience, uh, this is what they have well, asked. As, as, as explained by... by, by Sorry. Yeah, good question, yes. The, the last question, Tito, would be um, how far can the political condition influence the economic situation if it is the, the decisive force? As well as explained by um, um, Engels, uh, changes in the economic conditions in the means and or the forces of production. Uh, uh, changes in the forces of production, even ahead of, uh, you know, a new kind of relations. Well, uh, the development of the forces of production uh, precede uh, uh, the taking shape of uh, uh, the uh, uh, relations of production uh, as a rule in society. Um, so, uh, but anyway, even relations of production uh, occur first before there is uh, the institutionalization of uh, 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 force called the state. No, uh, so economic development occurs before the development of the state power uh, that is newly arisen because of those new uh, productive forces. Uh, that is in general. Um, now, uh, but uh, you see, uh, political conditions uh, can be uh, so um, uh, utilized by the revolutionary movement as to bring, uh, uh, bring about an entirely new social development. Uh, and that is well provided, uh, that, uh, that is well exemplified by the working class taking power. So you see, the working class arises in capitalist countries as well as underdeveloped countries, semi-colonial and semi-feudal. Um, the, the working class party that aims for socialism cannot escape eh, dealing with issues pertaining to, demo to democracy. Even in capitalist countries where the economic or material basis for socialism is the most developed, you have to take into account uh, the political conditions because, you know, it's not true uh, that Marx uh, was, uh, uh, Marx and Engels were close to the idea, uh, had, uh, you know, had, were fixed on the idea of having socialism in England because this was, it was the most developed uh, capitalist country. Because, you know, um, where capitalism is most developed, the bourgeoisie has the strongest force to suppress a revolutionary movement. Yeah. So, uh, before a capitalist class, as exemplified by Germany, Italy, and so on, before the bourgeoisie gives up power, it uses fascism. Fascism. So there is no straight line to socialism. Uh, but the working class is forced, compelled to, uh, if it wants to win, it must be good, must be excellent at using force to overthrow fascism. So the struggle for democracy in a well-developed country, in a capitalist country, is necessary, just as it is important for the, <clears throat> uh, for the proletariat in the less developed country, like the Philippines, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to adopt the program of the new democratic revolution, uh, which is not a, a, a direct... Uh, uh, approach. I mean to say, it's not a yes. It is a stage which you have to uh, to to win before you get on to, to socialism. But um, through the struggle for democracy in the capitalist countries and through the new democratic revolution in a country like the Philippines, 
uh, with the working class already in the leadership, that uh, working class leadership will make sure that the co main component of the new state, uh, the People's Army, um, uh, would, uh, would follow the class leadership of the proletariat and begin and begin the socialist revolution as soon as it, as as soon as the new democratic revolution is finally completed. So uh, and that means uh, well the general conditions you might still say is that uh, for socialism already obtained uh, under capitalism uh, it's just a matter of changing the the ownership of the means of production uh, from private uh, bourgeois to to public and so on. Uh, in in that general uh, in in such general terms, uh, one might say, well, it's, uh, it is as Engels has already explained. But I think uh, the political will and the necessary organized political mm -hmm. force to make socialism uh, becomes more evident uh, here, as the uh, in the sense that the working class. Uh, does not um, assert its uh, state power, is, uh, it does not assert itself politically by having uh, gotten economic power first, no? Um, what it gets is the uh, unity of the proletariat and the working class to overthrow the system and then establish socialism. And, uh, and then it converts, transforms private ownership of the means of production uh, to uh, the public uh, uh, ownership, so uh, the work the workers do not prepare anything economically except to uh, first develop their trade unions and their and then the revolutionary party. Uh, it does not mean they bring about uh, 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 a new uh, economic condition other than that which they created for the working class, for the capitalist class, I mean. Um, and you, you get the fine distinction? The working class was instrumental in the development of the uh, productive force under the control of the bourgeoisie. Uh, uh, and this thing it did for the, for the bourgeoisie uh, is the precondition for socialism. The, cap the, the working class does not have to build a new, eh? uh, a new, new uh, forces of production. Uh, the machines and the working class are there, constant from capitalism to socialism. So it's, it's a matter of political will and a, a matter of winning the revolution that they uh, uh, make the socialist revolution. Of course, in the further, uh, after the beginning of the socialist revolution um, and construction, uh, more things will be developed by the working class for themselves. But uh, uh, it must be understood that what they built for uh, capitalism, they can utilize directly uh, to begin eh? the socialist revolution and construction. I see. Again, thank you so much. Claro, ba? <laughs> okay, then. Uh. Hello, sorry, nearing you ako. Oh, no, I'm claro. And sorry for the technical difficulties. I think I have my webcam being uh, distorted again. I'm really sorry for that. Um, anyway, to our audience, thank you, Tito. Uh, thank you so much for participating and sending your questions to us and uh, being with you in this um, new, uh, this another episode of Engel Serie. Uh, thank you so much, Tito, for um, um, teaching us today. Ano po? Um, anyway, um, dyan po nagtatapos ang ating discussion on, um, on 
Anti During Philosophy on Political Economy by Friedrich Engels. Ano? Abangan po natin ang ating next episode sa ating Engels series, which is Anti During Philosophy on Socialism naman po. Uh, that is on November 22, 2020. Same time, same place. So make sure to note this on your calendars and catch updates on our Facebook group, NB Line Online. Ano po? Huwag kalimutan mag-like. Mag-share at mag-imbita upang sumali sa ating makabuluhan at nakamumulat na talakayan dito lang sa National Democratic Online School, Series with Tito Jo. Muli, maraming salamat po sa pakikibahagi. Ako po sa Miksamang Christ. Tito Jo, may gusto po ba kayong sabihin bago po natin i-close ang ating episode? Uh, nagpapasalamat ako ulit sa uh, lahat ng kababayan at lahat ng kaibigan uh, na lumawak kayo sa, web, uh, sa forum nito at inasahan ko uh, magkikita magsasama-sama tayo muli sa susunod na episode. Ayun. Ayun, Tito. So, uh, uh, muli po, maraming salamat po sa ating lahat. Mapagpalayang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Uh. Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proleta.